Good morning. My name is Brad Colburn. I'm uh, hooked into this church through our life group and the Monday night men's Bible study and, and the uh, facilities team. This morning I'm reading from Titus, beginning uh, chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, appeared bringing salvation for all people training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a body for his own possession, who are zealous for good works. Thanks, Brad. Well, last Sunday was the anniversary of what is probably my favorite moment growing up, or at least the most vivid moment uh, growing up. On June 9th, 2001, the Colorado Avalanche won the Stanley Cup for, at the time, uh, their second time in their five-year history. But alongside winning the Cup, it's most remembered for a particular moment, this, this really special occasion that came when the team got the Cup. If you don't know, there's, there's a tradition in uh, hockey where the team captain of the, of the team that just wins, they go up to the Stanley Cup, they take a picture with it, and then they get their time. They grab it, the first person on the team to do so, they skate around with it, they're shaking it in the air, they're kissing it, they then pass it on to other people who kiss it, so they're sharing germs with one another. Uh, but the first person that the captain passes it to is either the oldest guy on the team or the guy who's played the longest and has never won a cup before. And it just so happened that there was a guy on the Avs who fit both of those criteria. And so Joe Sackick, the captain for the Avs, goes up and takes the picture with it and, and grabs the cup. But rather than getting his time with it, rather than skating around, celebrating, doing anything with it whatsoever, he immediately, immediately starts to hand it off to another player. And I still remember Gary Thorne's announcing in this moment. After 22 years, Raymond Bork. And Ray Bork was still to this day one of the best defensemen to ever play the game. And he played for a long time in the NHL, but had never won a Stanley Cup before. He, he uh, played for uh, almost all of his career for the Boston Bruins, but had never got to that place where he won it all. And I know that sounds made up, but there was a time when New England teams didn't just win at everything. It was a glorious time. <laughs> but uh, the, the Bruins traded Ray Bork to the Avs so that he could get a chance to try to win it before the end of his career. He's played for so long, and he's finally here at this moment. 22 years of playing in the NHL at the age of 40 years old, 40 years old as a professional athlete, finally getting to this point. And as special as this moment is, and it, it really is special to me, I had a picture of Joe Sackick handing Ray Bork the cup on my wall, uh, almost all of middle school, almost all of high school, because it was such a special moment. As special as that moment is, it's more than a moment. There's more behind it than just this snapshot image of a man receiving a piece of silver hard hardware. And the reason why it's more than a moment is captured in that Gary Thorne quote. After 22 years, 22 years of being a professional athlete, uh, of playing all those games, and, and Ray Bork was known for being really healthy. He played a long time for 22 years. Think of how many practices go into 22 years of being a professional athlete. How many off seasons are spent getting in shape, getting ready? How many drills has he done to this point of doing the same thing over and over and over again until it's perfect, until it starts to be how he plays, until it shows up in his game time? 22 years of playing in this way. But not just that, there's also the 18 years of life before this that he doesn't get to the NHL. He's not a first round pick if it's not the years of dedication and devotion and practice that go in to him even making the NHL. What we have behind this incredible snapshot picture is a lifetime of quiet, faithful work done over and over to get to, to, get to that point. Ray Bork does not hoist the cup. 
without 40 years of life building to this time. And the idea is that what we do over and over is what shapes us, is what forms us, is what makes us the people that we are now, the people that we are living to be. That it might be that we're trying to develop a habit. So we're doing the same thing over and over again so that we have this skill or this uh, aspect of our life. There might be some behavior that we're doing or that we're modeling to others that shows us what's important to us, what is the significance that we are doing over and over that show us what we value in our life. Or maybe it's how we go over and over to our phones. That whenever we need comfort or guidance or, or to look something up, we instinctively grab our phones. And then what happens when we are feeling low? What happens when we uh, need some encouragement? Well, we do the same thing that we train ourselves always to do. Grab your phone. Or some uh, habit or hobby that we are looking to have. It all comes from a practice done over and over. The, the idea is that every person is being shaped by something to something. And if you want to know what that looks like, if you want to know what it is that they value, what it is that they're trying to be, look at their repeated habits. Look at their repeated actions. That is showing us what they're being shaped into. Now, this is significance. Uh, this is significant because the call of the Bible is for us to be shaped, to be formed into the image of Jesus. This is Galatians chapter 4, starting in verse 18. It says, It is always good to be made much of for a good pur purpose. Not only when I'm present with you, my little children, for whom I am again in anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. So Paul is writing to these Christians that he cares about, that, that he loves, but he's in anguish because they're not living yet in the way that God has called them to. They're, they're not yet fully shaped. They're not yet fully formed into the image of Jesus. And when I think about us as a church, we are people not yet shaped. We're not yet fully formed into the image of Jesus. And the call then that we see is the same call in the Bible as it is in all of life that these behaviors, these practices, the habits that we do over and over and over again, those are the things that shape us. So as we're looking to be formed in Jesus, what are these habits, these things that we do over and over that help us to be formed, uh, that help us to this point of Christ being formed in us? That's what we're gonna look at in the series that we're calling forms coming from this verse. What are these practices? Sometimes they're called disciplines or habits of Christianity, or practices of faith? What are these actions that we are called to do over and over as we're being shaped into this image of Jesus? So we're going to spend the next weeks looking at some of these disciplines. Disciplines like reading our Bibles, prayer, stewardship, work, fasting and feasting, Sabbath rest, these things that as we do them over and over, they form us into the image of Jesus. Now, I, I know I used a scary word in there. I called them disciplines. And, and so often as we think about these things, and even hearing this list of things, like it, this isn't a surprise. Oh, Christians are supposed to pray. I, I had no idea. Or they read their Bibles. Like, this is any person who spent uh, any amount of time in a church would know this list, would be familiar with, with at least most of this list. And yet so often we see these things as obligations, things that we have to tack onto our lives, often begrudgingly that we need to do them if we want to be good Christians at all. Or oftentimes we look at them and we feel a little bit guilty. Like, yeah, I know I should be having them as part of my life, but they're just not there. Or they're not there as consistently as I would like. In essence, these practices end up being a little bit like Christian broccoli for us. Yeah, they should be part of my life, but I think I'd rather do other things. But as we look at these practices, as we look at these habits, as we look at these disciplines, we see that they're more than mere obligations. They are tools that help us to form to be more like Jesus. And when we look at them, they're not something that, that pulls us away from life, that limits what we have going on. It's actually in these practices that it brings life. Richard Foster wrote one of the best uh, modern books on the disciplines. Well, I, I say modern. Can you say a book from 1978 is modern? Uh, in, in, I guess, the course of human history, it's relatively modern. Uh, but he, he wrote a book uh, on this that he calls The Celebration of Discipline. 
Do we ever think of discipline as being a place of celebration? But he makes this point that these, these habits, these, uh, thing, these parts of our lives that we do over and over are a place of joy and celebration. He says this. He says that we must not be led to believe that the disciplines are only for spiritual giants and hence beyond our reach or only for contemplatives who devote their time to prayer and meditation. Far from it. God intends the disciplines of the spiritual life to be for ordinary human beings. People who have jobs, who care for children, who wash dishes, who mow lawns. But neither should we think the spiritual disciplines are some, and I love the way he puts this, are some dull drudgery aimed at exterminating laughter from the face of the earth. Joy is the keynote of all the disciplines. See, the purpose of the disciplines is liberation from all the stifling slavery of self-interest and fear. When the inner spirit is liberated from all that weighs it down, it can hardly be described as dull drudgery. Singing, dancing, even shouting characterize the disciplines of the spiritual life. See, these things that we speak of, they're not mere obligations, things that pull us away from what we want to be doing, but it's in these actions repeated over and over that we receive life, that they put us in the place that God has for us that's for our good and for his glory. But, it, but it's not merely in the accomplishing of these things, as if things are going wrong in, in your life so I can just prescribe them to you. All right, so if you read a book of the Bible and then pray for an hour and then fast for a day, everything's gonna be going well for you. No, it's in these actions that drive us towards Jesus that help us to rely on his grace, that it's in the habit of doing these over and over again, over a long period of time, that that is what shapes us. That is what forms us. That is is how we are shaped to be more and more like Jesus. As we're talking about habits that we have, one of the habits that we have as a church is we go through books of the Bible together. This is our regular rhythm. We, we just got out of a, a book, uh, of ne- the book of Nehemiah, as, as that was what was setting our focus and the topics that we were focusing on each and every week. Now, there are times that we step away from this regular habit. Uh, this could be because there's an issue that we want to address within the church. I, I think back to the beginning of the year, we had a series called Flourish that looks at what does the Bible say about relationships? We were just seeing a lot of relational breakdown across our three campuses. And so what better place is we see a need to say, how does the Bible address this particular need? I think that's a good rhythm for us to have. But there's also times like the summer that we focus on a series that tends to go through a topic together. The idea being is we're all over the place. There's trips going out, there's vacations happening. We, we see it even on our staff as two of our staff are out of there. Brody takes off for Maranatha tomorrow. We're supposed to have a Thornton staff meeting scheduled Tuesday and we canceled it because I already have a one-on-one with Dakota. I didn't need to have another one since it's just the two of us around. But summer is a time when we're all over the place. And so it doesn't make sense to have a series that builds upon itself. Hey, you remember two weeks ago when, when the text at this point? No, I was on vacation. Hey, you remember last week when, when, uh, when this is the context for it? No, I was at Maranatha. And, and so what we want to do is we want to have a, a series that addresses people wherever they're coming out of as we're together in this time. And so we do that by looking at a particular topic. And yet, and this is important, and yet, even as we're in a series like that, it's always, always, always God's word that sets our direction and our focus for what we're doing. We are always in a particular text. And so, with that being said, today we're in Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, starting in verse 11, I'll reread it for us in just a second. But probably the most difficult part of the message today was narrowing it down to a particular text to do. I think if you were to go to any of the other campuses, they're doing a different passage because the Bible overwhelmingly speaks on this idea of how these regular practices over time help to form us to be more and more like Jesus. And that's what we see in Titus chapter two. Let me pick it up again in verse 11. It says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age 
waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. So a lot there, but I really want us to focus on what the subject of all this is. In verse 11, it says, for the grace of God appeared. And it tells us how this grace has appeared by, by showing us that Jesus, the arrival of our Savior, our God and Savior, Jesus Christ, that he gave himself up for us so that we can have life, that he has entered into human history so that we can have a history with him, that he has done it all. That is God's grace appearing to us. And yet so often, at least in my mind, grace is the thing that saves me and then it just kind of fizzles out from there. All right, then it's my action, my responsibility, what I have to do. But the subject of this whole thing is the grace of God appears. I want us to leave with a bigger understanding of grace than we might've had coming into it because grace is what permeates through this entire passage. And we'll see it show up in a few different ways. First and foremost, the aspect that we're probably most familiar with is that grace saves us. That God, by his grace, has brought salvation for all people. The idea being, the language behind this that we find elsewhere in the Bible, to get the book of Romans, that we were dead. That we are dead in our sins. That means inactive. Dead, dead people don't tend to do a whole lot. We are unable to do anything to take ourselves out of this position. But the language that's given to us is that of saving, of rescuing, that while we are dead, Jesus came to this world, entered into our place of brokenness and despair and heartbreak and rescued us from that spot. That this world that feels like it's so inescapable from all that's broken, all that hurts, all that brings sorrow, it is inescapable because of our sin. And yet Jesus does not leave us in that place. Jesus does not leave us to our rebellion. Jesus does not leave us to our sorrow, but brings us to new life in him solely by his grace. I thought about just describing this to, to present to us what this good news of Jesus is. And yet there's a perfect passage right after our time in Titus 2. That is just, it feels like it'd be a disservice to not get to there. Paul so eloquently describes how we are saved by grace in Titus chapter 3, starting in verse 3. It says, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But, that word's so important, but... When the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that in being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. All right, I know there's a lot of big Christian words in there, but just for our purposes today, focus on, on just one question. What are our actions in this passage? I mean, yeah, the, the, the description of verse three, which aren't very good, that don't feel nice, but describe us as being dead in our sin. After that, what, are, what, is, what is our role? What, what is it that humans do here? Nothing, nothing whatsoever. We were adrift, we were astray, we were lost in our sin. But what then does God do? I mean, just running through it quickly. It's, we see that God, our savior appeared, that he saves us, that he washes, he renews, he pours out, he justifies, he makes us heirs, he gives us this new identity, this new state, this new place that we are in, rescued out of being adrift and into this new place with God. And, and none of it is because of what we have done. It says, not by our works, solely by his mercy. We are saved by his grace. And yet, maybe you see this in your life. I, I definitely see it in my life. I, I'm not yet where I want to be. That I've been saved by the grace of God. He has done it all, not by anything that I've done. I've not coerced him. I've not forced him into this. Solely by God's work, I'm saved. And yet my life does not reflect his glorious action. It's not as though we're saved by grace and then boom, we start living perfectly. 
Or, or he rescues us and bam, we're, we're right in heaven where nothing is adrift. And we're all still here. We're all still trying to live faithfully. We're still trying to live in the way that he calls us to. And yet, if your life is like mine, it doesn't yet look like what I want it to, let alone what God calls it to look like. Maybe you've heard or maybe you've said something along the lines of, well, it just doesn't seem like my faith works. Like I keep trying and I keep trying and I keep trying, but I'm just left disappointed. I'm not seeing the impact that, that it should have. I'm still distracted by other things. I'm still pulled in different directions. I'm still living as if God hasn't saved me by grace. I'm trying and it's just leaving me disappointed. It's a position that, that Martin Luther described uh, in, a, in a phrase that, he, it, that reflects the truth of every Christian ever since Jesus. He says that we are all simul justus et peccator, at the same time just and sinner, saved by Jesus, but yet to be formed in Jesus. And that gets to the next part of grace in our passage in Titus chapter 2 that speaks, that is the response to this situation. This life that we live in that does not yet look like what we want, what is the response to that place? It's this idea that not only are we saved by grace, but that grace trains us. That we are saved fully. Our, there's nothing we can add on to our sa salvation, nothing more that we need. He has done it all, and yet still we are growing we're being shaped, we're being formed over and over into the likeness of Jesus by grace training us. And there's a few different aspects to, that helps us see what this training looks like that comes from our passage and the surrounding area. So I wanna camp out here for just a little bit to see what does this training look like that grace is doing in our lives. First and foremost, this is training that comes from understanding. That it's only as we see who God is and what he's done, it's only in response to what God has done from us, understanding that truth that any Christian action comes. I, I make this point a lot, and I hope you get sick of me making this point, because it's so important that we get this, that we do not live in this way that God calls us to. We don't add any Christian habits to our life. We aren't formed over and over by our practices in order to get anything. There's nothing more that we need. We we're not trying to clean ourselves up so that God looks favorably at us. God has made you his child. God has made you valuable. And it's in response to that work, in response to a saving action that we live. It all comes from this understanding of who God is and what he's done that any Christian living takes place. And we see this in the passage as well. Right before our passage in Titus chapter 2, verse 10, uh, Paul is writing to a specific group of Christians, encouraging them to live in a way that all Christians are lived to. And, and, he, and he phrases it so beautifully. He says to live in a way that uh, they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. To live in a way that they adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. And it's speaking to this point. It's in response to this truth, this teaching that God has saved us, that we live. This adorning, that's not prior to. That's not to cause the salvation. This is all in response to what God has done. We live in a way to adorn the truth of what God has done for us. And this idea of adorning, this means that we seek to live in a way that beautifies God's action to those who are around us. The idea being that as we understand what God has done from us, for us, we start to wear what we believe. It shows up in our lives. It changes who we are because we understand the doctrine of our God, our Savior. So we start to adorn that. We wear what we believe. But even as we have a role to take in this, even in response to this understanding of God, it's still not all on us. We're not the primary people working in this one. That this training comes from the Spirit. It's not based off of hard work. It's not based off of our effort that if you just try harder, well, try and doesn't seem to work. Well, try even more. That's not the encouragement. That's not the teaching that comes here. That the primary person at work in this place is the same God who saves us. I mean, you look at Titus chapter two and it's got one subject line. The grace of God appeared, bringing salvation. Okay, so grace brings salvation. Christians tend to understand this point. Yeah, we are saved by grace. The grace of God appeared, training us. Who's the subject of the action? 
Who's the subject of any life change taking place in our life? It is the grace of God that is training us there. The idea being that, that uh, the slow inward work of God within us, which comes primarily through the sending of his spirit that shapes us and forms us over time. Richard Foster, again, speaks to this issue. He says, by themselves, the disciplines can do nothing. They can only get us to the place where something can be done. They are God's means of grace. And so why do this series? If it is that God's the one who saves us, God's the one who's, who's the primary one working within us to bring formation, to change us, to shape us, to be more like Jesus, don't we just need to sit around and wait for God to work? I mean, of course not. And it goes back to that Richard Foster quote. That these actions that we do, these habits that we have over and over, the shaping that comes, the shaping always comes through repeated practices over and over, that the work that we do is in response to God, in anticipation of God. We live as he calls us to because we know that it's in these habits done over and over that that's a place that God works in. In other words, this training comes from practice. This training comes from practice. This life of living this way over and over again is a place that we meet God who's already working within us. And there's two practices that are called to be repeated in Titus chapter 2. In chapter 12, it says, uh, back all the way, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us, still that grace of God, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. You see those two things, training us to renounce and to live as God calls us to. To renounce all that seeks to separate us from God, to pull us in different directions, that, that takes us to a place that just leads to more brokenness. And instead to live in a way that draws us near to God as he calls us to, that's for our good and for his glory. To renounce and to live. That's the regular practice of the Christian life, the daily habit of the Christian life. To renounce and to live, to renounce and to live, to renounce and to live. And that's what we seek to do in these disciplines to do exactly what's being called of uh, us in Titus chapter two. I, I think so often we, we hear this list of disciplines and, and we, we have a much smaller picture as to what is being accomplished than we realize. That's in doing these things, these regular habits over and over that we are partaking in what God has called us to, to renounce and to live. Let, let me give an example through prayer. So often we, we might have even a good definition of prayer of it's us in conversation with God. It's us entering into relationship with the God of the universe. And that's so good. And that's so right. And yet it's also in prayer that we are doing this practice of renounce and to live. I mean, think of all that tries to guide you in this world. Think of all, all the different places that we can go to for support or encouragement or hope or direction or anything like that. And in prayer, we're saying no to those things. We're renouncing them and saying, God, to you alone, you alone am I looking to. You alone am I the one that I'm, uh, are the one that I'm turning to in this. I renounce all these other ways and turn solely to you, God, for direction, hope, and guidance in life. And yet so often we see prayer as just us having a conversation with the ceiling or us offering up little hope balloons and maybe something will come from it. And yet it's in prayer that we're confronted with the God of the universe. We renounce all else around us and we say, only you, God. Isn't that a bigger picture of prayer than we tend to have? As we renounce and we live over and over is the practice that's given to us. We're reading the Bible. So often we approach to reading the Bible as, well, I have an assignment in my, my reading plan, so I need to accomplish that today, or I just need to get to the end of this page, or I'm in a Bible study and I don't want to show up and not have anything to contribute, so out of fear of, of not looking like I did the work, I'm going to finish this quickly so that I can participate in this. So often we treat reading the Bible as something to be accomplished, and yet it is a place where we renounce and we live. Think of all that tries to give you instruction in this world, that speaks to you of saying, this is who you are. This is your value. This is your worth. This is your place. This is who you are. And yet it's in reading the Bible that we say no to those things. We renounce all other voices, all other places that are trying to say who I am. When I, I want to hear, I want to be attuned to who God, the God who made me says I am. That his way is my path. 
That it's in reading our Bible that we renounce and we live. Not just have our eyes glance over words, but we participate in the life that God has for us. And as we do these things, we have these practices over and over that shapes us. We're all being shaped by something, but we're seeing the call of the Bible. We're seeing the greatest call of our life is to be shaped by the God who's given us life. So as these practices become part of who we are, they start to become second nature to us. They start to become instinctual. How much thought do you put into tying your shoes? How much thought do you put into your commute in, uh, in the morning or coming back from home? You ever have those moments where you remember getting in the car and now you're standing in front of work, but you're not really sure what happened in between. Like you're just kind of on autopilot. That's kind of scary when you think about it. Like, how, how did I get here? But we don't need to put that thought into it after a while. It's not, all right, two streets from now, I need to take a right and then I go a half mile and then take a left. Like we don't have that thought process. We just do it. We know what it is. We've done the habit. It's instinctual to us. It just comes second nature. Does the drive to pray come that easily? Does, does reading our Bible, uh, the instinct of that, come just as easy as tying our shoes? Again, it's as we see who God is and what he's done, as we see that he is a way for us to live that's for our good and for uh, his glory, that drives us towards these habits, that drives us towards these actions, these disciplines of the Christian life. None of it, as we're being guided by the Spirit in this, none of it is just try harder, try more. You just grit your teeth and bear it. You know, you just really got to keep, keep pressing at it. That's not the instruction of the Spirit within us. It is training. It is showing us this way. It is showing us the good for us. It is showing us these habits that over and over shape us and guide us into the greatest thing there is, which is the likeness of Jesus. As we're so taught and guided, as we put them into practice, they become like second nature to us like muscle memory. And finally, the last part of this training is that it's for good works. This training into the image of Jesus produces in the people of God as they look more and more like him, good works. We saw that in, in Titus chapter three. It's, it's in Titus chapter two as well, that these people of, God's own, of Jesus' own possession are zealous for good works. And these go to every part of our lives, individually, these good works come out at home, in this church community, in our community around us, wherever it is that God takes us. As we are trained by him, this starts to work out of our lives as good works. The idea being that, that these individual habits and practices and disciplines don't stay that way. They don't stay locked up within us, but they burst out representing Jesus to the world as we adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. That they aren't just these quiet habits that we have. Don't just stay quiet, but they reveal themselves in our lives wherever it is that God has us. I mean, think about how this shapes your home. Whoever it is that lives with you, your immediate family. Think of there's, there's these habits done over time and how that starts to change and shape your household as you are seeking to be formed more and more in the image of God. Think of uh, how many decisions that we make, how many times that we're trying to figure out what is the right plan for, for the, my, my family's future? What is the right action to take? How much different does that look when we trust solely in God for all guidance, which comes from a reliance on him every single day as we renounce all else and live for him? Think of uh, resolving conflict. I don't want to assume there's conflict in my household. I don't know what happens in your household, but uh, think about just for me when there's conflict, when there's difficulty, when there's butting of heads of people. What does it look like to have a, a reminder of how Jesus reconciled me to God as my basis for seeking reconciliation? A reminder that comes from a quiet, steady, faithful life over and over of renouncing and living for him. Or parents here who, here who want uh, their kids to know Jesus. It, we're, we're never given a guarantee of that's happening, but a great way for, for your kids to know who Jesus is is for them to see you knowing who Jesus is. That, that they are formed over and over as they see you are formed over and over. Given an example of Jesus as the basis for all their life. Or marriages. Marriages are really hard. They're difficult. We have two people that are opposite and we're supposed to be one. That it, doesn't, it doesn't always feel like that works out. 
What does it look like then for the basis of our marriage to be not just in, in that's where my identity is, not just putting, uh, like, uh, trying really, really hard on all this, but it's rooted and settled in the fact that I am. Because I know who God has made me to be. Because over and over, I'm being shaped by him to be more and more like him. And that spills out to every part of my life. This church, this church grows and is shaped as individually we are formed and shaped by Jesus. Our community, we we go out as salt and life because we are made salty by this practice of being with Jesus over and over. And wherever it is that God has us, this quiet individual practice of us drawing close to him, this quiet practice of us as a community drawing close to him, this starts to work itself out in our lives as good works wherever God has us for as long as he has us here. And that gets to the last part of grace here. We see in this passage that grace is so much bigger than just a starting point for us, but our lives are coded in grace. Grace is what saves us, grace is what trains us, and grace is what sustains us. That as we live this life, we are doing so because we're saved by God's grace, we are formed into Jesus' image as we're trained by this grace, and as we live in this world until the day we see the greatest of all futures, the greatest of all hope fulfilled, as we see Jesus face to face, it is grace that sustains us to that point. Philippians 1.6 speaks to this idea. It says, and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. This time that we're living now, this, this part where we're pulled in different directions, it's difficult to do, it's hard to remain faithful. We are sustained in this time as we are waiting to, for this day for Jesus to return. We are sustained by grace. And yet waiting is not inactive, the, the picture of the Christian life is not one just thumbing through old magazines and, and until our number is up or the one that we're waiting for appears. No, we live our lives now in grace-inspired, hope-filled action. Grace-inspired, hope-filled action. And that is a regular, faithful, consistent, shaped over and over life as we wait for the greatest of all things, as we wait for a future, as we wait for something that's better than any moment there is. So often, it seems like, that the instinct with us is the pursuit of moments. Ah, oh, there's the sermon that I heard one time and it just really spoke to me. I mean, obviously, I'm speaking of a sermon you would have heard elsewhere, uh, but, but that type of situation or, oh, worship was so good today. It just really met me where I needed it to be. Or I had such a great moment of prayer that it just really felt God's presence in that time. Or went on this retreat and I, I've never been closer to God before. Those are good things. We should want those things. Don't hear me speak badly about those. I'm gonna speak badly about this though. So often it feels like the modern Christian life is just trying to recreate moments. And this sermon wasn't as good as this other one that I heard, so I'm gonna go try to find something else that will give me that feeling again. Ah, worship, I just wasn't feeling it today. So I'm gonna find a different place that'll more resonate with me. Man, prayer just didn't seem to be working today. So I I gotta try to recreate, I gotta sit in the right spot, gotta do all this stuff, have, have a peaceful Instagrammable moment. Or what's the next event on the calendar? What's the next thing that I could be doing? Because maybe there, that's where I'll feel God again. We don't need moments. Moments are not what makes up the Christian life. We need training. We need consistent practice of faithfully responding to the ever faithful God these regular habits done over and over again. That is what participates in the grace that saves us. That is what is part of the work that God is doing and his grace that trains us. That is how we endure till the end. As we are waiting now, it is grace that sustains us as well. Because it's in that point, as we faithfully over and over again in this training, that is how we hear the greatest of announcements that there is. It is in this faithful response to Jesus done over a long time that we hear this greatest of announcements from God that's promised to us in the Bible. Maybe it sounds like Gary Thorne, maybe it doesn't. But it's something very similar. At least it starts off the same way. The announcement promised for those who are formed in Jesus, faithful to the end, and this regular practice 
hear the words after 22 years or 32 years or 82 years or however long is spent being formed in the image of God, a faithfully part of this work over and over again to be formed in his image after all that time to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. 